Hello and welcome to another Science Book Club where I bully, badger and otherwise beguile other scientists into recommending science books with me. So I get other scientists onto this to talk about science books or science fiction books that have inspired them as a scientist or in their love of science or they have found particularly interesting. With me this time is Teresa from the University of Western Australia. Teresa's working on gravitational wave pipelines. Thanks for joining me. No worries. Can you tell me a bit about your gravitational wave pipelines? What does that involve? Uh, yes, yeah, so we're searching for gravitational waves and the data is coming from the LIGO and Virgo detectors. And we have a pipeline, which is basically just a computer program that analyzes the data for us. One of my coworkers wrote the program and then out of that program, I get to analyze that data and try and find gravitational wave events. Ah, okay, so this is to make it faster than it was before? Because I know like the first detection was three minutes from the event to the detection flagging into the computer or something like that? Yeah, so we're working on reducing the latency, uh, which is the time it takes between the actual event being detected and us working out that an event was detected. Uh, and there is the possibility that we might be able to determine that a gravitational wave was occurring before it happened because the signal for some events can uh, extend out before the actual really interesting bit, the merger of the neutron stars or the black holes. And then you can try and get telescopes on it in time. Yes, yes, right. that is the main purpose, is for what we call multi-messenger astronomy, where we get normal electromagnetic telescopes, so radio telescopes, optical telescopes, X-rays, to observe the same event as the gravitational wave events. Okay, thank you. So Teresa and I have both brought books this week that inspired us as young scientists. So Teresa, what have you brought? Uh, Today I've brought one that I read, or one very similar to the one that I read when I was 10 years old. This one actually came out when I was 11, so it's not the same one, but I don't remember that one because I was 10. Uh, it's called The Mystery of Black Holes. Ooh. And this book, or the one similar to it, is what inspired my love of space, especially black holes. Uh, so in it, I got... I distinctly remember a page very similar to this one where it talks about the Schwarzschild radius, mm. which is how much you have to compress a star or a planet or basically anything in order to make it into a black hole. And I just remember loving that concept of just being able to turn anything into a black hole. So, okay, that's cool. So you said you were 10 years old. Is this something you sort of read again and again? and? Uh, so I got the book out because I was doing an assignment. Right. Uh, this was a year five assignment and for some reason I picked black holes. I think it might have had something to do with Stargate, but I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> Samantha Carter was pretty awesome. Samantha Carter was awesome. Was Stargate out back then? Yeah. Yeah, oh. I think it came out in 97, 98, oh, somewhere wow. around there. So around oh, yeah. about when I was 10. I didn't see Stargate until I was uh, at uni, and yeah. so, but I remember going back to the old episode and thinking, oh my god, that was recorded on VHS. It looks rubbish. Mm. <laughs> yeah, Stargate, <laughs> Stargate was awesome, as was Sam Carter. Yeah, but I don't attribute my love of space to Stargate. Fair I enough. attribute to a book like this and the assignment that I did when I was 10 years old. And so after that, did you read more? You sort of oh, wanted yes, to find out more yes. about astronomy? Then, then it was... Uh, avalanche of astronomy based books <laughs> oh, okay. and I have a lot of books that I was gifted uh, as a child and a teenager with lots of beautiful pictures in them of space that really also helped inspire my love of space and uh, yeah just kept me going really. So the book told you about all well, about black holes but that they suck everything in that nothing can come out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I, was, so when I was a kid about that age, um, well, I, there was, uh, at school, at primary school or elementary school as Americans call it, a friend's dad was an astronomer and came in to talk about black holes. And we actually both know them, him, Mario. 
Oh, yes, Mario. Yeah, so I, I went to school with Mario's daughter, so he came in to talk about black holes mm -hmm. and things like that because he was an astronomer. Teachers had asked him in. Most of the other kids absolutely freaked out. You weren't at all freaked out by... I thought black it was holes. fantastic. I thought that the way I wanted to die was being sucked into a black hole. I didn't think that, but I didn't. <laughs> so, so I listened to Mario's talk with, with wonder. And he, so he was talking about the death of the sun and black holes. And I, kids don't get what five billion years is. I, don't get, I still don't really appreciate five billion years. But still, I thought, OK, that's not going to upset my Saturday morning cartoons. And so I, I really enjoyed it. And it, th his talk is something I remember to this day, not the sort of details of it. I didn't even know it was him. It was later on when I worked with him here at UWA. Mm. He said, did you go to school with my daughter? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember that talk. That was great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the other kids freaked out and just found these things really, really scary. Oh, God, don't want to know about that. Mm. So I'm just... Uh, I just find it interesting that you read about these and were, were fascinated instead of freaked out like most other people <laughs> seem to be. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that before. So maybe that's a, a, maybe a common thing between astrophysicists. Like we, we see black holes that like, cool. <laughs> I want to poke it. Yeah. I want to know what's in it. As that was one of my things. It's like, I want to find out what is happening inside that black hole and I want to prove Einstein's theories wrong. Wow. Because that's what you're doing now and you've got this... <laughs> So, so from the age of 10 to now, you've had this continuous a career progression uh, is the wrong term for it. But <laughs> sin since then, you wanted to know about black holes and you're working on detecting them now. Yeah. I find that interesting because I didn't have such a sort of relatively linear path. Mm. I, I meandered at the age of 10. I was more interested in David Attenborough mm. than I was... Um, in physics, and I came to physics later. It wasn't until the end of high school that I started solidifying on physics as what I was really interested mm. in. So that's really interesting. Um, so I also have something from around, Ooh. I can't remember exactly whether I was eight or ten years old. Let's have a look at the <laughs> 1999. So I must have been got this the next year when I was ten. So I wouldn't have quite had this when I was eight. So about the same age. So I've got. Ten's a good year. <laughs> So I've got Horrible Science, Bulging Brains by Nick Arnold. These are quite old books, but they're still being revised and in print. There's a whole series of them. You can get Horrible Science books about um, uh, biology and botany, chemistry. There's just one on explosions, which was cool. Uh, forces, so like Newtonian physics. Uh, but this was the first one my mum got me when I was 10 years old. Uh, I think she got me Vicious Veg, which was a botany one at the same time, but this was the first one I read, and I fell in love with these books. So they are silly and gruesome. They're full of cartoons with people standing and kicking on cats Aww. and things like that. Yeah. And Actually, mine's got weird cat experiments. Dr draw drawings of brains. <laughs> Come to think of it, that makes sense. Phys <laughs> physicists like cats. Uh, and it's a, bit, it's a bit silly and gross. I mean, it... It constantly talk, uh, making jokes about bodily fluids and things like that to get grotty little kids interested. But even so, even at 10 years old, that was not the bit that interested me. What I found absolutely fascinating about these books was they didn't just tell you what was known about the science. They told you how it was found out. Mm. And a lot of other things didn't do that. I don't know if your book did that, but so a lot of other kids' science books say this is basically just give you the fact. Black holes are big. Black holes come from dying stars. Well, how do we know that? So this show, this told me how we found out what we know to that date about the brain, mm. how MRI scanners and CAT scanners work and how they use oxygen flow or blood flow around the brain to work out what bits are lighting up. And it didn't shy away from the gruesome bits, things like Romans cutting open people's heads and having a poke and particularly one guy who was working on the railroads, tamping dynamite down into a hole with a metal rod. It exploded, shoved the metal rod through his frontal oh. lobe and lobotomized him. Oh. Yeah. Did he survive? He survived. Oh. <laughs> and, but his, 
demeanour, his personality had changed. Mm. And that was, that basically taught science about what became lobotomies and about what the frontal lobe does and a lot of your emotions and you is in your frontal lobe. Mm. So it got gruesome. I mean, I was reading this at 10 and the, that's the kind of age range this book is for. <laughs> this is not for later teenagers. This is for primary and elementary school age kids. And it was horrible, but it's horrible science. And that's what I appreciated that I, from these books, I understood science to be this messy human endeavor, that it's not this linear progression of fact to fact or just smart person thinking really hard and then <laughs> science being done at the end of it. And it, it admitted there's things like that. There are some insanely talented or smart people in the world, and particularly when you got onto the biology ones, I would talk about the people who came up with taxonomic classes and some of them were just really deep into the autism spectrum and so they wanted to shut themselves away for 20 years and just file everything and that helped the progress of science. But at the other end, you've got the accidents, you've got people thinking, what's that weird yellow squishy thing on that rock there? Oh, it's got this use in genetics. Mm things like that. And so I devoured these just about every week or every fortnight uh, when my parents went shop shopping, I'd run into the bookshop. Back then, uh, this is four pounds on the back because I guess this one came from England, but uh, they were less than $10 back when I was 10 years old. So I'd get about one of, I'd get these once every week or fortnight and devoured just about all of the the ones in the series and then moved on to the neighboring series like there's Horrible Histories and The Knowledge and also Dead Famous. Dead Famous is a similar series that did Elvis and Roald Dahl but also did Einstein mm. and talked more about his science than about him. And so that by then I was about 12 years old and so learning about special and general relativity at the age of 12. Later on finding so out that the book got... Yeah. <laughs> But no, the, these were really inspiring to me because they showed me how science is done mm. and they were accurate. So as a practicing scientist now, as an experimental physicist, these books are accurate in portraying how science really happens. Mm. And that was what was so important to me, what fascinated me about these. And these really did start pushing me on my path to being a physicist. That's fantastic. So this was the first one that you read? This was the first one I read. Yeah, I, this was probably not the first in the series. Um, oh, you don't have to read those in order, though. No, exactly. <laughs> but That's what's great about those. <laughs> no, they're, they're one-offs. Well, some of them you want to read after the other, like maybe you read the one about explosions after the one about chemistry and things mm. like that. So did you want to be a different type of scientist every time you read a new book? Um, no, not exactly. <laughs> uh, it, it happened more slowly. So I started with this one and Vicious Veg. Mm -hmm. And around that time, I was more interested in things like David Attenborough and so wanted to be a biologist. Mm -hmm. um, and so I suppose there's things, it says in the front here, there's things like ugly bugs and nasty nature and disgusting digestion. Ooh. And so Delicious. I think I probably read all of those ones first. And then as I got out and then as I ran out of the biology ones, I started reading the chemistry and physics ones. Uh, and I think as I over the next couple of years, as I read these, I probably started drifting more towards chemistry. Mm. And then physics came later in high school as I found I was interested in the physical side of these things, how chemicals work, how animals work, mm. that sort of thing. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm very impressed with yours as well. If that, if from, you can trace now back to when you were 10 years old. <laughs> 20 <that> years <laughs> of wanting to be an astrophysicist studying black holes. Uh, that's kind of good. It's nice to have this <laughs> vision as a child. I want to be that. I want to be a fireman. I'm going to be a fireman. Whereas yeah. I, I was, I, from eight years old, I had no idea what I wanted to do, and I've sort of been stumbling my way through ever when, since. When I was eight, I wanted to be a mathematician. So physics, especially general relativity, really appealed to that yeah. because it was very heavy on the maths, ah, and I okay. just loved maths. It's always so, been my favourite subject. See, kids, books can change <laughs> the course of your life. Oh, yeah.
<laughs> Teresa, thank you very much for joining me Anyone to do David? this. I'll see you around. Yeah.